When a life is at risk, each decision is crucial and any hesitation can be deadly. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of people who took action to try to save a life on Rescue 911. We begin on a summer day in 1988 when Michael Hike left his house in New Iberia, Louisiana to go for a swim. An actor doubles for Michael, but the rest of the people have returned to help us reconstruct his story. Eugenie Hike had given her nine-year-old son, Michael, permission to join his friends at the local pool. It was 16-year-old Heath Wallace's first summer as a lifeguard at the Iberia Golf and Country Club. That was the only lifeguard in duty. The lifeguard stands are high, and so you can watch the whole pool area. I decided I had to go run some errands. On the way, and I stopped at the country club. Do you want to come with me? No, no. Okay, well, don't go home until I come back. Michael's mother was eight and a half months pregnant with her third child. I figured if he was having such a good time with his friends, I was going to let him stay. So I said, you know, be careful. I'll be back. But Michael's friends soon had to go home. Time to go. You've got to be there in five minutes. Let's go. Bye, Mike. Bye. Bye. Alone in the big pool, Michael soon got bored and cold. But the 18-inch deep baby pool was always much warmer. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon. While watching the baby pool, I noticed a non a 10 year old person in the baby pool. I decided I wanted to coax, so I walked from the life course stand to the snack bar outside. and heard the scream for help. His left arm was underneath his left leg, stuck into the drain. So his head was about six inches under the water. His eyes were open, his lips were blue. He was dying. When he heard the boy was in trouble, Bobby Bolden was with golf pro Eric Indest. I couldn't visualize how it could happen until I went outside. Immediately, Bobby Bolden jumped in the baby pool. The lifeguard was trying to give Michael mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. He was very heavy, very taut, and we were all very scared. The boy's arm had been sucked into the drain. I went to the pump and turned it off. Then I ran back into the clubhouse to get something to bail the pool. It wouldn't take very long just to get the water below the level of his mouth so that he could breathe on his own. The call for help came in at 4.42 p.m. Time was really of the essence. We were not going to have a whole lot of time if this young man was going to have any kind of a chance to survive. Two ambulances were dispatched immediately. Ed Murray was the senior paramedic. In a situation where there's a potential drowning, we want to anticipate a cardiac arrest situation. So we generally send two ambulances. having my arms around his chest to tell immediately that he was not getting an expansion in Michael's chest. At that point, I told him his air passage is blocked. I remember that from Boy Scout. Clear the airways. 
at which point we, we got a, a good expansion in his chest. I remember Mr. Bobby telling me to keep on breathing for him. I just heard, keep on, don't quit. I didn't hear nothing or see anything but Michael and Mr. Bobby. In a matter of two and a half, three minutes, he became more buoyant. We could feel now that he was breathing. Shortly before that, he bit me. I almost wanted to cry, but I realized his problems were a lot greater than my own. Once Michael was breathing, they managed to untangle him from the brain. I reached down into the water, grabbed him by his right knee, and I kind of gave it a little quarter turn, and he popped right out. Mr. Byer picked up Michael, and at that time, I was already backed off, up against the side, scared. I thought I did something wrong. No one knew exactly how much time Michael had been trapped under the water, but they feared it had been too long. The boy was unresponsive to any sort of stimuli. He did have some fluid inside his lungs. I was very concerned because it can cause a very serious complication called aspirative pneumonia. Also, because he had a loss of consciousness due to lack of oxygen, my concerns at that time were certainly about brain damage. When the paramedics arrived, it was such a strange feeling that we had just been through this, the three of us. and. It was drained. I sat down uh, near the pool and just cried my eyes off. Ready? I just stayed at my lifeguard stand and I didn't watch him close enough. I should have prevented the accident before it happened. I closed my eyes and I just see his face, what he looked like in the water. The eyes, the blue lips, cold look. Couldn't get that out of my head. On the way before I got back to the country club, there was an ambulance. So I pulled over for the ambulance and I said, gosh, I hope whoever's in there is okay. Not knowing that my son's in there. When I heard that he almost drowned, I was really, really scared. I mean, that was my brother and he, he could die. En route to the hospital, he didn't regain consciousness. I was worried about cardiac complications in the fluid of his lungs at that point. Can you hear me? Michael, look, you've been in an accident. We're taking you to the hospital. Michael, can you hear me? I couldn't believe it because I had just seen him. I had guilt feelings. I was so sorry. And Michael was just like such a perfect child. I became really frantic and I said, we've got to find Morris, we've got to find Morris. Immediately felt like, you know, the worst. Uh, I thought my kid was dead. I was just in denial, telling myself he was going to be fine. You know, I was asking the nurses, why are you doing all this? And they said, because we have to see how much fluid is in his lungs. And that depending on that is whether or not his brain's going to start swelling, which means he'd have brain damage. Everybody got a chance to go see him. And then I got a chance to go see him. I said, like, like, I love you, Michael. And, like, when I say it usually, I really don't mean it. But that time, I really meant it. We met the doctor that is in charge. He said, I think your son is going to be fine. The lifeguard that gave your son artificial respiration, mouth to mouth, saved his life. And you need to really thank him for it. I didn't think I deserved to be congratulated. I was just doing my job. The young lifeguard has become friends with Michael and his family. The cutest thing that came out of this for me was at that time I had become a candidate for mayor. I got a phone call from Michael. And now, he wanted to be my campaign agent. Bobby Bolden was elected mayor of New Iberia. Michael was released from the hospital after two days. There was no brain damage. When I was under there, I was thinking that you can, my mom was going to have a baby in about a month. And I was thinking, you know, will I ever be able to see this baby? Where will it be? And, all. and then everything just blacked out. 
Three and a half weeks after the accident, Michael's baby sister, Eugenie, was born. Every once in a while, any time, any place, I'll be driving along and it'll hit me that I could be driving along right now and not have my son anymore. And, and I'll, I'll, get, uh, I'll get a little uh, melancholy, but uh, it's almost a feeling of gratitude that, that you can't you can't put into words. I've thanked them, but I could never thank them enough. Could never thank them enough. Next. I knew what they were going through. When you can't get air and, and you see all this clear air out there, is the one way to get it, and that's to jump. <laughs> 